uh, that women more and more are part of the industry. The hardest for me was to integrate my children with my professional life. In America, you can, there are tax deductions, you can tax deduce uh, lunch with your business partner, but not a babysitter, for example. All these things, I think, they were the hardest for me, and I think for my mom as well. We had a fantastic female cinematographer who shot Kill Your Darlings named uh, Reed Morano. She's really on the rise. She has two small children, and one of the financiers took me aside and said, do you think it's such a good idea to hire her? And I was like, well, first of all, that's illegal. <laughs> and and uh, second of all, like, if it was a guy, you'd never even, you know, she says she's got it sorted. Of course she's got it sorted. I finished my film in time, on budget, and then I heard a friend of mine, a man, is two weeks late on schedule, overpassed the budget, well, but he was so moved, so sensible, you know? He has good excuse, you know? Sometimes I drive me crazy, you know? But I cannot complain. I have to be <clears throat> Iron Man. <laughs> Iron Woman. I, no, Iron Woman is not enough. <laughs> I think we face those same challenges of being taken seriously, if, you know, trying to be tough, but not a bitch. And I've said to a, a male colleague, Ted Hope actually, said to me at one point when a financier was speaking to both of us in a pretty patronizing way, he was like, oh, how can you stand that? And I said, I am so used to being patronized. You know, I kind of, kind of doesn't bother me anymore. One of the problems, and nobody talks about this, is that the leading men, in their contract, they have approval of the leading lady. It should be the director's choice, not the actor's choice. The fact that he has a say, mm -hmm. who he gets to kiss or not, mm -hmm. I find that very sexist. Often you'll see, well, women are good at producing because they're good at nurturing. Yes, they're caretakers. Um, you know, they're, they're caretakers. Women are great at multitasking. And I think that those, um, it's too reductive. I mean, I didn't think when I was standing on the set of Parting Glances, like, oh my god, I have to produce because I can nurture and I can multitask. <laughs> I just really want to take care of the director. <laughs> Who is our highest grossing female movie star of a certain age? Pat, let's say over 40. Meryl Streep, probably. Do you, I doubt that she has ever been paid commiserately with the male movie stars that she's worked with. Uh, she might get a, what they call, the back end the back end, I love that, I love that phrase. We're gonna give you a big back end. Well, thank you, I've got a big back end. <laughs> I'd like it all up front. When these strong women that are like top stars get the script, every, everything is ready, right? The man don't want to play second banana or an equal role to the... Second banana. Ah, no. I like that, I like that expression. I'm learning I know. Things. It's not about <laughs> me. This film is not about me. Mm. You know? So all these men that have sort of a name, all these big idols that we adore, that we look, at, look up to, not all, let's say 99%. There's always Matthias. I I'll vote. Play. Matthias for president. <laughs> I'll play 25th banana if I can play with you. And advice that you would give to, to female producers? To be natural. Don't try to fight. Don't try to be too strong. Play with your a tool. Play with your tools. Your what tools. you have. Yeah, what you have. With your character. And don't think too much. <laughs> it will work. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Let's I, I go. Think the go, mentality, girl. <laughs> the mentality is changing. Yeah. No? When I saw Catherine Bigelow yeah. in America, yeah. Yeah. so incredible woman, yeah. win. Yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Now, after all these years, I feel like I was lucky in my life from the beginning. And I think it's important now for me to help. And it's like a mission, you know, to help uh, people and especially women to create and to, and to express their, their art. How do we get more people, I guess namely men, involved and engaged in this discussion? There is a very simple answer and really a very simple solution. You get them involved the same way that you get men involved in anything. 
and the only way you can inspire them, money. <laughs> yes, let me explain. What are you talking yes, about? I mean, not you, but you are like one separate uh, star. That's why you're here. When I was trying to produce things for Latins, I came up with this, I'm sorry, but it, it, brilliant idea. <laughs> to try to look for statistics that prove our power as a consumer. Because we, we are such a huge population in the United States and we were not represented anywhere. When I was trying to get Ugly Betty on the air, I went to a company that buys time on television. I showed them the numbers of how much we represent in money and I was able to come back to ABC and say, look, I already sold every spot for the commercials in the show. I was trying to do a telenovela where the leading role was a girl that was not pretty. But once they saw the money, eh, we got on the air immediately. Do you feel there are questions we're not asking, that we should be asking? Is there a, a line to this discussion that we're missing? I would say the one line actually is we're not talking about television. Actually, I think that's where extraordinary female-driven stories have, have been driven to. And, um, and there's amazing stuff happening. And I think that's, you know, that's a big, big piece of it. We need to start thinking about where we can tell the stories. And I found, at least in American cinema, it's, on, it's with cable networks. They're the ones that are putting money behind mm -hmm. uh, a wider range of filmmakers, whether they be male or female. I think our prejudices against television have to start shifting because it's a different world now. And I think that by saying we need to, we're, we're, keeping, us, we're keeping it back. We're keeping the conversation back a little bit by saying we need help. We don't need help. We need money. We don't need help. <laughs> We need money. We need platforms, we need voices, but we don't need help. We look at the statistics as victims. Right. This is not what we're doing. We have to come in a position of power. It's not like, oh, you haven't noticed. No, it's like, you don't know what you're missing. Mm -hmm. And when they know that what they're missing is money, they'll jump in that boat, you know, at, sp at speed light. It's done, like I'm saying, women in motion, we're moving. It's moving, we're moving, it's more about catch up. Yeah. I've seen the most strong women in Iran, in Egypt, in Lebanon, in countries that people, women are so oppressed and under so much pressure. There, women are just like machines, like they are so strong and free. And I think it's a very contradictory story that I was feeling freer as a woman in Iran mm. than outside because I think it's it's very I can't I, I wish one day I can really make people understand that there is some kind of a it's like you are free in a big prison but sometimes I feel like on the other side of the world we are just in prison in a in a free world it's about living, it's the fire that is burning in the heart of people, which no one can ever take that from them. I'm very proud of being a woman. If I, again, I had a choice of coming back to this life, I would choose to be a woman, and even in Congo, even in, the, in, in Afghanistan, because I think it's a big um, part of humanity, being a woman. Thank you. <laughs>